start recording. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Lee Habegger, and I'm the executive director for Seafood Harvesters of America. Um, we are a national commercial fishing organization representing 20 different groups around the country from Alaska to Hawaii to Florida to New Hampshire. Um, I'm joined here. Well, today is our first webinar in our four part series on climate change and fisheries. Um, you'll be hearing from Dr. Julia Mason, a so social ec ecological system scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund, um, who will provide sort of an introductory presentation about the effects of climate change on oceans, fisheries, and communities. Like I said, this is the first of a four-part series, so we're really thinking about today as building a foundation um, for our next three webinars that will cover fishery science, cooperative research, and will culminate in um, a webinar on NOAA's newest, or one of their new um, climate initiatives, which is the Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative. Um, Dr. Mason will cover a variety of topics today, including ocean warming, ocean acidification, regional variability, ocean currents, and heat transport, um, as well as some uh, extreme weather events and, and storms. Um, the presentation will be followed by Q&A and a discussion about how you all are seeing climate change impact your communities, um, your fishing businesses, um, or any fisheries that you work in. So before we get started, just a few reminders for today. Uh, we are recording this webinar today, but only the presentation, as I just mentioned. This recording will be posted on our YouTube page, so folks who aren't able to join or if you want to go back and review anything that you saw today, uh, you'll be able to access that presentation later. Again, the question and answer portion of this webinar will not be recorded. You all are muted and off camera. If you'd like to ask a question during um, the Q&A part of this webinar, please use the raised hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and it will alert us that you'd like to ask your question. We will unmute you or we will ask you to come off mute um, and then you are uh, welcome to come off camera if you'd like as well. Unfortunately, there is no chat function. I spent a decent amount of time yesterday trying to figure out how to get that back on, um, but, but I could not. So um, if you have any questions during Dr. Mason's presentation, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I'll be monitoring those and happy to um, ask, uh, pause Dr. Mason and ask those questions if they're relevant, clarifying questions. Um, but we may also save some that are more general uh, for the Q&A section. So um, I think that's it. Oh, hi, Allison. You made it. <laughs> Great. Um, Sorry, technical issues. <laughs> that's okay. No, no worries. Thanks for joining. Um, Allison here is a senior manager um, for U.S. Fisheries and Ocean Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund. So I'm um, happy to have you. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties there, Allison, but, but glad you're here. So Allison and I will be monitoring on the back end. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, so for now, Dr. Mason, take it away. Great, thank you. And I'll pause um, a couple of stops during the presentation so that there's some opportunities to ask questions as we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and please yell at me about the, whether or not the view is working. Um, it looks good. Amazing. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Lee and Allison, for organizing this. Again, my name is Julia Mason, and I'm excited to talk um, about a lot of science with you guys about the effects of climate change on oceans, fish, and fisheries. So I'm gonna be going through why the climate is changing and how it affects the oceans and specifically covering warming, like the absorption of heat in the oceans, sea level rise and ocean acidification. Talking about how these impacts vary regionally across the globe and across the US, how that affects marine life and of course then the impacts on, on fisheries and fishing communities. So why is the climate changing? Um, it has to do really with the composition of our Earth's atmosphere, and specifically the concentration of what we call greenhouse gases, which is it's a category of, of gases or molecules that have the ability to absorb and trap heat. So what happens is that um, the Earth receives all of its heat from the sun, this solar radiation coming from 90 million miles away. And if we didn't have an atmosphere, eventually all of that heat that we receive would kind of be dissipated out into outer space 
um, and the earth would be like the moon, freezing cold, uh, no life would be possible. But fortunately, we do have an atmosphere, which is composed of a mix of different gases. We have oxygen that we breathe, nitrogen, as well as these greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide um, is one of these types of greenhouse gases. You've probably also heard of some other ones like methane. Um, actually, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. You can think about how on a winter day, a cloudy winter day is kind of warmer than a clear winter day because those clouds are helping to trap the moisture. And uh, sorry, trap the heat. Um, and that's exactly what greenhouse gases do. They are able to trap this heat that's dissipating out, um, absorb it, and kind of re-radiate it back to the earth to keep us warm. Um, and we call them greenhouse gases because it's like the windows in a greenhouse that keep your tomatoes warm um, and keep them alive during the winter. And so these greenhouse gases together, it's like it's like a um, they're forming a blanket, a heat trapping blanket that keeps the warm um, the earth warm and livable. And I want to stress that having some of these greenhouse gases, having some carbon dioxide or CO2, um, it exists naturally in our atmosphere. This is normal. We and all other organisms, plants and animals, breathe out carbon dioxide as part of our metabolic processes. Um, it also can come out of volcanoes and other geologic processes. And so we can think about this as normal CO2, normal carbon dioxide. But what's been happening is since about the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution is that humans have started burning a whole lot of carbon-rich coal and oil and gas, which has released a ton more CO2 into our atmosphere. Oops, sorry. Um, and so we can kind of think of this as, as rampant CO2 emissions. And having more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more of these greenhouse gases is like thickening that heat-trapping blanket um, and making the earth warmer and warmer. Um, and therefore making the atmosphere warmer and warmer. So we have way more CO2 trapping way more heat. And this has led to sustained long-term shifts in the overall global temperature and weather patterns. And so that's really what we mean when we're talking about climate change. And so then when um, then we have this warmer atmosphere, this heat being trapped in, in the air, um, that then interfaces with the ocean. And so the oceans are absorbing some of this heat. And actually, the oceans have absorbed 93%, the like, vast majority of this excess heat from this warming, from this heat trapping blanket. Um, in part because there's just a lot, the oceans are really big, there's a lot of volume there. And because water is really good at absorbing heat, um, it can hold a lot of heat. And so this is good news for us on land, um, but it means that the oceans have really borne the brunt of the heat impacts from, um, from climate change. And we're seeing this in rising ocean temperatures. So all, all over the world, the temperature has increased by about 0.14 degrees Fahrenheit per decade over the last century. And this has been accelerating in recent years. The past 10 years are the warmest years on record in the ocean. And you've probably seen the news from last month that we were seeing some of the highest temperatures ever reported on earth and especially in the oceans. So what I'm showing in this graph here, um, can you guys see my cursor? Um, but it's like, across the um, x-axis, across the bottom here is just kind of the days of, of the year. And each of these lines, each of these little spaghetti lines um, tracks the trajectory of the temperature in the global oceans over the course of the year. And the green is the average temperature um, between the 80s and, and 2011. And so, and this is global, it's because you might expect to see um, like a peak in the summer, but what we're seeing is that the Northern hemisphere is balanced out by the Southern hemisphere. Um, but the, the green is the mean over the 80s to 2011. The blue line up here, almost half a degree or more than half a degree above it is 2022. Um, and here's 2023 so far. You can see it's way above any of the temperatures that have been recorded in the past 40 years. And this is um, expected to continue and probably accelerate as more greenhouse gases are emitted. Of course, the amount of warming that's going to happen is going to depend on how much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we emit. And so I'm showing here a graphic from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which really represents the global scientific consensus. And they're showing here um, that the y-axis is the amount of temperature change that we expect in Celsius relative to a baseline level that they set in, um, in the 80s. That's that zero line here. And then the gold is what we've experienced in the past. So you can see that kind of steady increase. It started out below that baseline and now it's a little bit above it. 
And then the amount of warming is really going to depend on what we as humans do in the future. Um, and so we can kind of track some extreme possible future scenarios. This one in red is if we really double down on fossil fuel emissions, kind of go back on some of the progress that we've made, in which case we might see warming of about three degrees Celsius over five degrees Fahrenheit in the oceans. Um, and in this blue future uh, emission scenario, we're really um, like creating all the technological innovations that we have, committing to the policy agreements that we've made. Even then, we might see about a degree of warming um, above above level. Um, of course, the real future probably will be somewhere in the middle. Um, but really, yeah, everything, every every degree, every improvement matters for being able to mitigate some of these impacts on the ocean. Clear that um, as you've probably experienced this, these warming trends, both what we've experienced in the past and what we expect to see in the future, it's not like every year there's a perfect oh no, another 0.01 degrees gradual increase. Variable. Um, some years like this year are a lot warmer than the average. Some years we even see um, see cooling or a colder year than average. Um, and this is because. In part, there's just a lot of randomness and chaos in the way that the atmosphere and the oceans interact. There's a lot of moving parts that can contribute to these patterns. Um, and another is that this long-term gradual trend interacts with natural cycles of warmer and cooler years, like El Nino and La Nina, or um, there's decadal oscillations of kind of warmer and cooler regimes in the oceans. The other important point is that we often talk about averages. Um, but another thing that really matters to oceans and marine life are the extremes. And so we're also kind of thinking about the hottest possible temperatures that we experience, um, such as marine heat waves, which are becoming a lot more frequent, hotter, um, and longer. And these are kind of, it's, marine heat waves are when the temperatures are way higher than average for that re region. Um, these have been increasing quite rapidly in the past couple of years. And Warming is variable year to year, but it's also variable across space and across regions. So here in this map, these red, these kind of darker red regions are ones that have warmed a lot faster than other regions. Um, whereas in the blue, there's kind of blue and white here, there's even some regions that have cooled relative to the, um, the 1800s in this case. And we do see warming hotspots um, that are warming a lot faster than the rest of the globe. So for example, in the US, the Gulf of Maine, um, is one of those warming hotspots that's warming not faster than 99% of the rest of the ocean, um, only behind the Arctic, which is the fastest warming region. And the reason why we see some of this regional variability um, in part is just because the earth is tilted. And so the sun um, hits, the, the heat from the sun hits more directly at the equator um, and is more diffuse when it hits the poles. So there's a temporal temperature differential there. That's why the tropics tend to be um, to be a lot warmer. Um, and also because we have this incredibly complex and really quite beautiful system of, of ocean currents that are transporting and moving heat around. And so there's some areas that are closer to warmer currents, some areas that are closer to cooler currents that contribute to this. So what we have is because the earth is rotating um, and getting these like the rotation and the winds are pushing the warm surface area across the globe. And then that pulls colder water up from the depths of the ocean to replace it. Um, and that's often why that water is also really full of nutrients, which is why sometimes we get those big plankton blooms in colder water. And so this is transporting heat across the globe. It's also contributing to um, warming at the deep ocean. And there's also, I'm showing here these kind of like broad biggest currents, but there's also a lot of fine scale variability and counter currents, um, fine coastal currents that are leading to warmer areas um, in shallow and coastal areas. And you've probably also heard, um, there's some studies and news recently about how um, global warming and climate change is actually affecting this circulation um, and maybe slowing down some of these currents. And we see this most um, most pointedly in the Atlantic with the Gulf Stream, which is our really dominant current system where we're sh like water shooting up from the tropics across the Atlantic where it can warm up um, Europe. And then once it reaches the poles in Greenland, it gets colder and denser. So it sinks and it pulls down and, and um, engines like it, the engine behind that conveyor belt. But as ice is melting from Greenland, 
it's just kind of sitting on top of that um, that circulation, this fresh water that doesn't sink as fast. And so that is kind of slowing down that circulation, which could have huge impacts on um, on weather and, and temperature in Europe, as well as all of these ocean processes. Um, and just, I think the last point that I'll make about heat is that it provides fuel for storms. So more heat in the water that um, the oceans are absorbing from the atmosphere is basically just more energy in the water. And so that's power for storms. And we're finding that the threshold for creating a hurricane is just about 80 degrees Fahrenheit in the water. And so the more and more days that are above that threshold um, means the more and more likely that we're going to see hurricanes. And that's actually what just happened in Southern California, where we had these really warm July temperatures and August temperatures um, that could spur this, spurred this unusual hurricane event. So we are expecting storms to become more frequent, more intense, and to cause more damage, um, which of course affects safety at sea, um, the days that are fishable, and can cause damage to vessels and ports and infrastructure. The other impact of absorbing heat and of warming in the oceans is that it contributes to sea level rise. Um, so as, as temperatures are rising in the air and in the oceans, we're seeing melting ice from glaciers and from ice sheets, from ice caps in the mountains. And so that's creating meltwater that then flows into the oceans and just creates more water, <laughs> more substance. Um, I think that's kind of what we hear about most when we talk about sea level rise. But another contributor to sea level rise is just that warmer water expands. Um, just kind of like hot air expands and a hot air balloon and floats, hot, hot air rises. Um, warm water also expands. And so it just takes up more space. Um, and so this is also contributing to sea level rise. The oceans are just physically expanding and getting bigger. And actually over the past century, there's been about 10 inches of sea level rise. Um, about four of them have happened since the 90s, which is what we're seeing in this graph. This is the change in sea level rise globally. Um, and this gray line, which becomes this purple line, is the trend that we've observed. Scientists are able to parse out what's happening due to that kind of expansion due to heat and what's happening due to melting ice. And this thermal expansion is actually um, responsible for more than half of the observed sea level rise in the past couple of decades. Although we do expect the meltwater to be increasing um, as Greenland and Antarctica are melting. Um, sea level rise, of course, poses huge um, impacts to coastal communities. The risks of tidal flooding and sunny day flooding can damage property and infrastructure. Um, there's worries about areas that could be permanently underwater moving forward. And this affects ecosystems and fisheries too, because coastal habitat that might be important nursery or prey grounds like mangroves and seagrass beds um, tend to be these low lying areas that can get inundated. And just as um, warming is happening differently in different places across the US, this is also the case for sea level rise. Um, this is happening at different rates across the country, depending on their geography, their kind of their topography and their elevation, as well as those ocean currents. So for example, the Gulf of Mexico and um, the Eastern seaboard are seeing a lot faster sea level rise, these kind of dark blue arrows. Part of that again is because of melting ice in Greenland and the slowing of these currents piling up this fresh melt water on our shores. Whereas actually in Alaska, sea, level, um, sea levels are falling and this is because glaciers are melting um, and kind of relieving the land of that weight. And so the land is actually rising faster than sea levels are the land, land levels are rising faster than the sea levels. Um, I'm gonna take a minute to pause there we, as we've concluded our physics lesson to see if there's any questions. If anyone has any questions, just use the raise hand function down in the center of your screen, um, or you can put a question in the Q&A chat. Oh, um, Richard, Dick, I see you um, have a hand raised, so I'll give you a chance to ask that. You can unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, and, you know, this is kind of a, a, a question regarding, you know, the impact of potential offshore wind in our, like our California current, our areas that, you know, this potentially could be utilized. Um, in in thinking about, you know, the, the rise in of ocean temperature and the reduction in the and and or the use of that wind to create you know this offshore power 
Um, what is your prediction as to the potential impact to like our California current along the West Coast? Or, you know, what could happen with temperature rise in the water? And is there that thought or has anybody really looked at that? I'm sure they have, but I just, just a question that I have personally. So thank you. Thanks, Dick. This is the question about the impact of um, of warming water on the California current on, on, on like the upwelling dynamics? Or yeah, yeah, more or less the up, upwelling dynamics. And, and, you know, I mean, the use of the offshore wind uh, arrays would, you know, absorb some of that wind, you know, and potentially change the, the California current. Um, how, how impactful that would be is, is yet to be determined, obviously. But my question is, you know, I mean, with this potential occurring now, without the offshore wind being there, what are we doing? Or is there data that shows that that will or will not have impact? That's my question. I think those are both fantastic questions. Um, as for the impacts of, of warming on the California current, I think there are some studies that are showing that upwelling is intensifying. Um, and so that's one of the main features of the California current. Um, and kind of like bringing up some of these nutrients, but there's also like some different impact, like different levels of stratification that's leading to different levels of oxygen. So I think, especially when we have these more coastal systems that are right up against the shoreline, the studies become a lot less certain because coasts are so complex. Um, so I think I'm, what I'm trying to say is I don't know, but I think that we there are studies out there showing that we have seen impacts already, um, especially on those upwelling dynamics, and those are likely to continue. I have no idea about how um, offshore wind installations would affect the oceanography um, and kind of what those relative um, changes would be relative to, to the climate change impacts. Um, I apologize, but I'd be happy to look up some of those for you and try to follow up. Yeah, um, Dick, I, I also know that there have been, um, I, know, I know of at least one study off the top of my head that I'd be happy to share with you. So. Um, if I could follow up with you on that, uh, that's probably that's probably best. But go ahead, yeah, if it, you have it, a follow up. Yeah, and, and, you know, I do, I do agree, and 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 you know, I understand what you're, you know, what you're saying. It's just that you know, we need to kind of look at the the big picture, you know, and and understand the potentials that are there. Not to say it shouldn't happen, not to you know, not to be negative about it, but we really need to think about you know these changes that potentially can occur you know, as a result of something that we're trying to do that is, you know, an unintended consequence that I guess, it, you know, where I'm going with this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about how that will alter all of this upwelling because upwelling is our our lifeblood on, in, in the water. And, and I'm a commercial fisherman. And so, you know, I think about this consistently and we do see these changes all the time. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Dick. And, you know, I hear you. I think there there is a lot of concern around the country um, about offshore wind and perhaps the compounding impacts that could occur in it, like, together with um, climate. So, um, let me, Dick, let me follow up with you. I, I, um, I would, I would be happy to chat more with you about that. Um, any, anyone else have any questions? All right. Oh, uh, Katie. Yes. Let me. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Katie. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. We got gotcha. you. Um, my name is Katie Almeida and I work for the town dock in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Um, we on the East coast, as you know, we're going through development now on a massive scale and we have the same concerns um, that were just mentioned. And I was wondering if that report that was offered to be shared could actually be either sent out to the participant list or put into the comment section so we could all access it. I would be very interested in reading that. Yeah, I um, I will do both, Katie. Thank Stay you, tuned. appreciate it. Sure, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Fantastic, um, yeah. 
Uh, we're going to move on to from our physics lesson to chemistry, and then I'll take another pause for questions. Um, so we've been talking about ocean warming and sea level rise, which are kind of due to the effects of this heat that the greenhouse gases um, and, and CO2 are trapping in the atmosphere. But we're also physically putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And that's also kind of coming into equilibrium with the oceans and being absorbed. And that changes the chemistry of the water. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the chemical equations in part because I don't have them off the top of my head, but basically when this carbon dioxide um, interacts with seawater, it creates this chain reaction that results in, um, in more acid, more, more making the water more acidic. And these compounds also bind up the calcium carbonate building blocks that animals use to make their shells and their skeletons and just makes that less available in the water for them. So we can kind of think of ocean acidification as being like um, osteoporosis of the sea, that uh, the condition when your bones become brittle, there's not as much calcium, not as much bone mass. And this, of course, affects animal growth, um, especially for calcifying organisms, organisms that build shells like oysters, um, like crabs. This is especially affects them as, at their larval stages when they're first forming their shells. It can lead to um, slower growth or more brittle shells, thinner shells. Um, so there's direct impacts on species that we farm and harvest, and there's also indirect impacts. So for example, coral reefs, corals are, are skeleton building organisms and ocean acidification affects their ability to grow. Coral reefs are a really important habitat for a lot of um, fish species. If we have any salmon fishermen on the call, um, this is this kind of snail here is a pteropod or a sea angel. This is a really important prey species for salmon constitutes like 60% of a pink salmon's diet. This is an animal that creates a calcium shell. Um, and so they're also hard hit by ocean acidification. So there's kind of indirect effects as well on animals' um, habitat and prey. Maybe I'll just pause one more time for any questions on ocean acidification before moving on to biology. Feel free to raise your hand or question in the, any questions in the Q&A. Um, if you open the chat, I sent a link to an article about the um, upwelling and I'm, I'm about to put another one in there, but I'll also email them out. Um, all right, I don't, Julia, I don't see anybody raising their hand. All right, we'll go, go ahead. ahead and talk more about fish, the moment you've been waiting for. Um, so basically, because fish and a lot of other organisms that we um, that we target in fisheries, like crab, shellfish, um, they're cold blooded. So basically, all of their physiological and behavioral processes, like all of the ways that their bodies function, um, are are influenced by ocean temperature. How fast they grow, how much they're able to eat, um, how they, successful they are at spawning, the success of recruitment. Um, how fast they swim, where they go, all of this is really affected by the temperature of the water. And so as the ocean is warming and absorbing all this heat, experiencing both these gradual declines and or gradual increases and these extremes, we can expect that all of these processes might be affected. Um, and then of course that in turn affects um, how catchable or kind of where these fish are, whether they're easy to catch, maybe even how nutritious or um, the quality of their, of their meat um, and whether they're able to be found during legal fishing seasons or found in legal fishing grounds. And to really get into the details, um, fish like you and me, like all organisms tend to be adapted to an optimal body temperature where their metabolism and other body processes function best. Um, so, you know, if this is was like me trying to run my best mile time. If it's really cold out, um, maybe my muscles are stiff and I don't run as fast. There's probably an optimal temperature when it's nice and cool, but not too hot. Um, and then once I start getting really sweaty and cranky, that time is going down really fast. And so this is kind of the optimal performance zone um, above and below which these animals are maybe not growing as fast. Maybe they get really stressed and prone to disease or parasites. Uh, maybe have less re reproductive or recruitment success. And if animals are subjected to temperatures outside of this kind of critical zone, they could even die. And so this is when we really worry about heat waves and extreme events 
because maybe the gradual increase of half a degree or, or 0.1 degrees is still well within their um, ability to perform, but you might have these extreme events that could push organisms way beyond that critical threshold. And then different fish species have different temperature preferences. Um, so like I'm originally from California, but living in Boston, so it feels really cold for me. Um, there's plenty of my neighbors and friends who are much hardier and adapted to the cold winters um, that maybe can um, operate at these kind of cooler temperatures where their optimum is at this cooler temperature. Um, warm adapted species maybe have their optimum at a, at a higher temperature. Um, and additionally, there's some species that are really narrow in their preferences. So this blue um, grouper here, it has a much steeper slope and a much kind of smaller area where it's able to perform well. It has a smaller temperature niche. Um, whereas there's others like this um, butterfly fish in the green curve that are able to perform pretty well across a much higher, a much larger range of temperatures. They're more generalists. And so as we're going forward with this um, kind of warmer temperature, warmer oceans, maybe some more extreme events, we generally expect the more warm adapted species, the ones that can operate well at these higher temperatures, um, as well as these more generalist species to be doing quite well, um, whereas the more cool adapted or the narrower niche species may, may not fare as well. Another nuance to add to this um, is that warm water holds less oxygen. Um, this is just kind of the case of all, um, it, this is true of carbon dioxide too, actually. Um, and kind of, you can think of how a, a room temperature soda or a beer is less fizzy than an ice cold one. Um, and so this means that there's just less the oxygen for fish that's available for them to breathe, um, which can have impacts on post-release survival for catch and release species or for bycatch species. And there's actually evidence that fish might be evolving towards smaller bodies. Um, because that requires less oxygen to, um, to maintain their um, enough oxygen for their tissues. So we're seeing maybe a 20 to 30% decrease in body size as um, oceans are getting warmer and have less oxygen. And so therefore to escape waters that are maybe too warm for their optimal body performance or that hold too little oxygen, what we're seeing is that many fish species are shifting their distribution, shifting their habitats toward the poles, often going north in the US, or toward deeper waters to find cooler waters or find more oxygen. Um, we've already been seeing this occurring in some regions. It's definitely projected to continue. So what I'm showing here is some work from my colleague, Kristen Kleisner, that looked at um, the distribution of cod, which is a more cool adapted species, um, maybe a species like dogfish that is more warm adapted, and in the red, here we see like the past, the 60s to 90s, the red shows better habitat, the dark blue um, shows like worse habitat, it's outside of that thermal envelope, outside of that performance curve. And cod has been seeing a decrease in suitable habitat here in the Gulf of Maine um, in George's Bank. Sorry, this is um, Massachusetts here in Long Island. Cod's been seeing a decrease in habitat, it's getting more of that dark blue and we expect in 60 years and 80 years um, for there to be kind of a lot worse temperature for cod. Whereas smooth dogfish, which is warm adapted, in the beginning of this study in the 60s, we really only saw a little bit of suitable habitat um, for these dogfish at the southern margin here. Whereas in the future, as temperatures warm, um, those dogfish may be able to shift their habitat up north. And we're seeing this both um, kind of like as a steady gradual march um, along the east coast, but this can also happen um, as like really sudden appearances or disappearances. Like for example, I think this happened with squid off of Alaska during the warm blob um, during that 2015, 2016 El Nino event. Um, there have also been kind of extreme drastic shifts um, where species might migrate, they might appear for a couple of years due to a, a big temperature shift and then disappear. And of course, this is a, a good adaptive strategy for species that they're able to move and find temperatures that work for, again, for that optimal performance. But some species might not be able to move if their habitat is stationary, like a coral reef or a seamount. And additionally, there can be um, differential effects um, that have broad ecosystem consequences. If, for example, um, a prey species is moving faster than its predator species, um, or you know, there might be a new competition or a new predator that enters and is um, eating everything in the ecosystem. This just can have broad ecosystem, ecosystem effects as well. 
And so then taken together, um, expecting these warmer adapted fish to be increasing it in abundance and cooler water species, cooler adapted species to decrease in dependence. We might be seeing um, fish shrink in body size in warmer waters. We're also expecting this distribution shift in habitats towards the poles and toward deeper waters. On a global scale, this is projected to create this massive widespread redistribution of fish biomass across the globe. Um, and this is already actually playing out in what we're seeing in global fisheries catch. There's been more warm adaptive stocks um, in catch portfolios and fewer cold adaptive stocks. And also overall productivity has been going down. Um, warming scientists were able to kind of parse out what was productivity losses due to warming versus overfishing and other factors and think that there's about a 4% decrease that we can attribute to this, um, to warming waters. And moving forward, the hypothesis is that we're gonna be mostly seeing places in the, in the tropics and lower latitudes in the warmer regions. Um, losing fish biomass, whereas these more temperate and poleward regions in yellow in this diagram might be um, gaining fish biomass. Julia, Dick has his hand raised. Um, Dick, do you want to ask a question now? Is it a... Oh, I guess I should allow you to... Go for it. There you go. Okay, thank you. No, you know, I mean, it's not It's not really a, a big deal. I can wait till later, but... I just wanted to ask, and you know, I'll ask it real quick. It's a simple question. You know, okay. are you able are you able to utilize the fisherman's knowledge? Because I mean, we've seen species shift in the last 10 to 12, 15 years, and we have watched, you know, this change in climate, you know, consistently. And 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 you know, that is our that you know, as as fishermen in general, that is our 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 lifeblood is our ability to be able to recognize these changes and being able to adapt and find the you know the resource that we're trying to focus on. Um, are you able, or have you been able to utilize the the fisherman's knowledge? Because I know it's citizen science, but in reality, we're there every day. On the water, we pay attention. That's our life. If if that's utilized, I really feel like it could be an additive to the data that you could compile and get a more realistic perspective. And, you know, uh, like almost you know as uh, as it's happening, rather than have to you know gather data from other sources. I just wonder if that's available or has been used. Thank you. I'm sorry that was a longer question than I meant to have it be. So my apologies. Of course, Dick, I'm so glad that you asked that question. And I absolutely could not agree more that you know you you guys are the real experts. You're seeing it every day out on the water. Um and we'll after after this I hope have some discussion to talk more about the impacts that, that you're experiencing in your day to day. Um, and I think that there's going to be another webinar, um, we'll also get to this, that's specifically about cooperative research and cooperative research opportunities, because as you say, exactly, like, even if we're seeing these long-term impacts, all of the figures that I've shown here tend to be more at the global scale or like at the very high level. Um, and it's really like the kind of regional details, the more fine scale observations that are going to be critical to have those kind of real time responses and specifically the management responses that are fast enough to allow um, fleets and fishers to adapt. And so coming up with ways to get that information in the hands of managers in the way that they're able to respond or even just kind of collectively among fishermen um, is going to be a critical need going forward to be able to have climate ready fisheries management. Um, the Graphs that I'm showing here, I think, are based on like long-term surveys and, and really on catch data, which does not give you the full picture of what's going on out in the water. And so uh, I think all around, definitely at EDF um, and all through the fishery science community, there's been a huge focus on trying to incorporate more fishermen's knowledge, acknowledging that, again, these are the experts who um, are collecting data every day and have a lot more um, coverage, even than some of these scientific surveys that tend to be more static. Mm. Thank you very I'm, much. I don't think that answers your question, but like I just I totally agree with you, and I think that that's a critical need, and that's going to be one of the big answers going forward is coming up with more ways Great. to have operative research. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Um, I think that's a great segue into this next slide, which is basically that these distribution shifts, all of these impacts that are happening really, you know, complexly, different um, experience, different impacts being felt in different regions, it's creating a lot of challenges for management. Um, specifically because a lot of the ways that we traditionally manage fisheries are very slow processes that kind of maybe depend on these long-term surveys. Maybe they're based on static boundaries that aren't moving with climate change or are based on historical dynamics that are no longer holding as we're going forward. Um, fish also aren't respecting our um, national boundaries and economic zones or jurisdictional boundaries. And so this has already sparked international conflict over fishing rights. Um, internationally, even within countries, I know like in the US, we're seeing black sea bass and summer flounder crossing between the management council jurisdictions, creating conflict or, or really just questions about how to allocate quota, how to distribute things fairly, how are we going to have more um, adaptive and transboundary management. Um, and so this is, of course, a big issue among states, among regions in the US. And I also wanted to just zoom out and show this global picture um, because moving forward, this means that some species, some fish stocks that countries are fishing could fully disappear from countries' economic zones. Um, and this is most likely to happen in the tropics where countries are the most dependent on fisheries for food and for livelihoods. So this map is showing in the red um, the countries that are expected to lose the most stocks that like completely leave their exclusive economic zone by the end of the century. And you can see it's a lot of tropical nations, it's a lot of small island nations that are really dependent on these, um, on these fish for food and livelihoods and have tended to contribute the least to the carbon emissions that are causing global warming. And so this is just like a really large scale climate justice issue. Julia, um, I see Katie just raised her hand. Let me yeah, um, go ahead, Katie, you should. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when looking to see um, it, so this is telling us fish that are shifting away from the EEZ. Mm -hmm. Are there any graph to sh graphs um, to show what is shifting into their EEZs? Yeah, that's a great question, and I I do I do have some. Um, they're yeah. like a lot more complicated looking, but I'll I'll send a couple of papers in the chat once we're in the discussion. Let me make a note of that. Okay, yeah. yeah so I'm um, I'm I'm from the Northeast. Um, so you know, yes, we are seeing some species move into cooler, deeper waters, as, as you described in earlier slides. Uh, but we're also seeing, you know, southern species usually seen, you know in mid-Atlantic or normally I should say seen in mid-Atlantic in great concentrations moving into, I hate to say quote unquote, our waters, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like our jurisdiction, I would, I should say, uh, the Northeast council's, uh, jurisdiction. So I was just wondering if, um, you know, I think that's an important, um, thing to add, or at least like, you know, a counterpart to this, just to, to show that there are movements in and out. And I'm sure there are reg regions um, or places around the world where they might not be seeing something like that. And in that case, you know, it's unfortunate and they're in trouble. Absolutely. And I'll just, I'm just going to go back to this previous slide for a second. And it's a little, I'm sorry to have these colors, the same colors meaning different things. Um, but in this one, the yellow, the yellow color actually indicates a potential increase in, in catch potential. And so there are areas that are expected to benefit. Um, and of course, you know, which species they, these are, are they the same value? Can you catch them with the same gear? Um, these are all big questions that I think are hard to address at the global scale. Yeah, um, so this this is, oh, sorry. May I just ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. Can you go back to that um, slide? So that's interesting. Like I don't have a scale to look, you know, to, to be able to tell, but when you're looking on the East coast of the US and you see that big, you know, yellow, yellow blob extending out into the Atlantic Ocean. Like, how far out is that? You know, would it, like you said, you don't have the species that are in there. It's like, cause I could tell you right now, if you're just looking at that, like the, our commercial vessels aren't going out that far. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, what is it that you're capturing out there? You know, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Katie. Thank you. Um, and again, I think that's another really great segue. This is where I was hoping to um, to end this and, and prompt some discussion that, you know, these 
we're talking kind of, I've been talking a very high level about physics and chemistry and biology, um, but these have real impacts on people. You, the real experts are here in the audience on, on how this is affecting you and your communities and your fleets. Um, I've just kind of collected some of the potential impacts on fishing communities here, kind of from for individual anglers and fe fleets, this could mean losses of income if there's a fishery closure um, or loss in productivity. A lot of um, fleets are adapting by fishing in different locations or different species. And definitely want to stress this can mean um, new opportunities to like capitalize on a new species um, or, or an increased harvest. Um, but of course, some of these new species might require different gear types, different permits. Um, there might be fuel costs associated with shift shifting to different locations. Of course, there's safety concerns from increased storminess. Um, there has been evidence of people leaving the fishery and the associated kind of loss of identity and knowledge that comes with that. There's also um, effects on the broader supply chains and infrastructure for the um, all of the supporting industries for seafood and fishing, um, potential damage to ports and infrastructure from sea level rise or storms, um, supply chain disruptions with when you know processing facilities for a specific species or a specific state um, are now becoming disconnected from those distributions. And then a whole range of kind of the more intangible but really important impacts that are happening socially and culturally even psychologically around um, impacts to sense of place if people's homes are being inundated or if they're losing that identity as a fishing town um, the impacts on food security and diets heritage and culture um, traditional knowledge and local knowledge that is held that as we've been saying is um, such a the life's blood of how we can think about and interact with our fisheries and once again i want to um, just be mindful that these impacts will be felt unequally and tend to hit the most marginalized groups the, the most. Um, a great example that Katie just brought up is that maybe a fish are increasing out in the high seas or further out than the boats that are actually able to access those resources. Um, you know, who's going to be benefiting from, from these increases versus decreases. Um, and so maybe I'll bring this slide back for our discussion. But I'm just gonna give you a little summary of what we talked about, and then I'll hand it Julia, over to me. Oh, yeah. sorry, Katie. Katie has her hand up, and it came up on the last slide that you were on. So I'm just gonna allow her to talk. Um, I think she probably had a question on this slide. Thank you, um, and thank you for letting me um, sure. raise my hand <laughs> and asking these questions, or even just um, I. I just have a you know something to offer on here with. Uh, so this is climate impacts on fishing communities. Um, I would even say to add, there'd be climate solution impacts on fishing communities, um, such as offshore wind, um, because you could even have a lot of this related to offshore wind, um, safety concerns, leaving the fishery, uh, conflict issues, supply, chains supply chain disruptions, food security, um, fishing in different locations or different species. A lot of people, if you're not in the fisheries, you don't understand you know, the permit structure and management structure in that we cannot just go fish anywhere we want. You know, there are closed areas, protected areas, gear restricted areas that you know, someone from the squid fishery, um, that's what my company relies on. You know, we can't fish anywhere we want for squid even though squid might be in that area. So when we have, um, we have all these wind farms being built on our traditional squid on and near our tr traditional squid grounds. We can't just pick up and go somewhere else, you know, because of the type of gear we use, we are constrained to a certain area. So um, I think a slide or something like that um, might be a little bit helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katie. Yeah, definitely want to stress that this is um, this is not a complete list. And I was hoping that in our discussion, people would share some of the other impacts or kind of which ones resonate with you. Um, and I did want to honor both what Katie and Dick have been saying about offshore wind, um, that there's a double whammy of having to, of being impacted by and needing to adapt to both the climate impacts and to the mitigation strategies. Um, and that this is, um, yeah, this is absolutely something that's worthy of study and, and of discussion. Thank you. Um, and and just to, to follow up, to say quickly that, you know, as someone from the fishing industry, we are extremely concerned about the impacts from climate change. It's it's now just going to be how do you tease those you know impacts from climate change and impacts from offshore wind construction you know out to sea, so um, we just you know we've got a double whammy heading to heading towards us. So it's it's 
it's pretty stressful. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Katie. I'm going to do a quick summary and then we'll um, open it back up so that there's time for more discussion and comments. Uh, so what we've talked about, we kind of went through all of <laughs> everything that I that I learned in college and grad school about climate change in this uh, 40 minutes, but we have rampant carbon dioxide emissions that are thickening this heat trapping blanket, um, trapping heat in the atmosphere, and this has been warming the oceans. When we have thermal expansion and melting ice, that's contributing to sea level rise. It's also changing ocean circulation and currents um, and creating more intense storms and putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And then also that's being absorbed into the oceans is changing ocean chemistry. We learned that warmer waters can impact fish growth and their size, their recruitment, their population abundance and their distribution where they go. Um, we also talked about how warming and sea level rise and this changing ocean chemistry, ocean acidification, um, have ecosystem impacts. They can alter food webs and fish habitat. And different regions and different species will see different impacts, of, and both from um, these direct climate imba impacts, from indirect climate impacts, and from the impacts of our mitigation strategies, um, and therefore require different adaptation strategies. Thank you so much for your time and for your questions and these insights that you were brought, brought up. I'm going to turn it over to Lee to um, talk about these next um, webinars and then welcome more questions and discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. That, that was really, really great. Um, and thanks for giving us a little shout out for our upcoming um, webinar. So um, like you see here, we'll have a fisheries and science uh, or sorry, fishery science and climate uh, webinar uh, in a couple weeks on Thursday, September 7th. I think it's at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we'll have a um, cooperative research and climate webinar on Wednesday, September 20th. And then we'll wrap on Wednesday, September 27th with um, a presentation by Dr. Michelle McClure with the Pacific Marine Environment Laboratory, um, who is helping head up the Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative at NOAA. Um, if you need the registration link for any of these, you do have to register separately. So, um, shoot me a note and I'm happy to get you those registration links. Um, and, uh, Allison, do you have anything you want to share before I stop the recording? I do not. I'll just confirm that all upcoming webinars are at 3 PM Eastern and hope. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, all right. I'm going to stop recording.